Aloha and mahalo for joining Kukua Council's 2020 mayoral debate with Rick Blanchiardi and Keith Amamiya. I'm Lila Moore, president of Kukua Council, one of Hawaii's oldest advocacy organizations. Today, we hold the first public debate of Keith Amamiya and Rick Blanchiardi, who were selected during the primary election from a very large field of very remarkable mayoral candidates. In preparation for this important debate, Kukua Council studied Honolulu's mayors. Frank Fossey served 22 years, the longest cumulative tenure of any Honolulu mayor. The Nihilus Blaisdell Center, the bus, the satellite city hall system, the elected neighborhood board systems, the innovative H power plant, summer fund programs for children, the annual Honolulu City Lights Festivals, and the Shaka sign are reminders of his tenure. As old timers what made Frank Fossey memorable, and many will respond that he understood his community and was in touch with his people. Kukul Council also studied some of America's best mayors as measured by popular national journalists. When Shirley Franklin, a first time political candidate, became Atlanta's mayor, the previous mayor had completely damaged public trust. Franklin inherited a massive budget deficit, which was nearly twice what she had been led to expect. The homeless population was exploding. The city's infrastructure was so bad that environmental agencies were fining Atlanta $20,000 $20, a day for its leaking sewers. Franklin responded with what appeared to be political suicide, cutting 1,000 jobs from the city payroll, hiking the sales tax, and increasing property taxes by 50%. She laid off half her staff and slashed her own salary. Then she went on to win a second term and was recognized with the Profile and Courage Award by the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. When John Hickenlooper of Denver first ran for office, local pundits recommended that he keep his day job, brewing beer. As mayor, he inherited the worst deficit in Denver's history. Without major cuts to city services or layoffs, he offset the shortfall by reducing city employees' pay and slashed his own salary by 25%. He did the unthinkable and he took on unions by pushing for incentive-based compensation for public employees, second term, a term that he didn't complete because he was elected to be Colorado's governor. Remarkably, both Mayor Shirley Franklin and John Hickenlooper were first-time political candidates. They courageously succeeded in their city's dire times to be recognized as America's and as among America's best mayors. We hope that this encourages both the public and our candidates that past political experience is not required for success. And we hope that one day, one of you may be recognized as one of America's best mayors. In further preparation for this debate, we examined the city and county Oahu resiliency strategy and realized that this study is, in the lingo of athletics, a playbook from which it appears both candidates gleaned valuable forward-looking strategies. Thus, we hope that viewers will understand that we will not ask questions which answers can be found in that very impressive Oahu Resi Resiliency Strategy book. Instead, we believe that viewers will find that our unique questions will help them make the best possible choice. So candidates, let's start this with an up to three minute introduction of yourselves. And uh, let's start with Rick Blangiardi and followed with Keith Amanil. Board members, please mute yourselves. Okay. Well, thank you, Lila. And I, I, I embrace that challenge that you just laid out about one of us becoming the best, one of the best mayors. So good morning and aloha. I want to thank the Kukua Council for hosting this morning's event and tell you that I admire the difference you all make as strong advocates for our community. Now, many, many of my friends and families and supporters have told me lately that I've been far too modest for presenting my professional qualifications. So I'm going to try something a little bit different today for this opening. I moved to Hawaii in 1965. I started my undergraduate work at UH and completed my education at Springfield College in 1969. Several years later, I returned to the University of Hawaii and completed my master's degree in educational administration in 1973. 
I spent all of my 20s coaching college football and worked my way up from being a graduate assistant to the assist, associate head football coach, defensive coordinator at the University of Hawaii. I then started in sales at KGMB in 1977, and I worked my way to the top of the sales management ranks in less than five years. In 1984, I took over Kiku, a bankrupt, rat-infested television station in Kalihi, and we quickly changed the call letters to KHNL. We introduced University of Hawaii Athletics to local television as never before seen in the islands. Later, I was asked to move my family to Seattle to run King 5, one of the most prestigious and award-winning television stations in the country. However, the ratings were failing. It was a turnaround job and we restored ratings and revenue well beyond all expectations. I was then went to CBS Television Network in New York and after two years at CBS, I took over KPIX in San Francisco, followed by becoming president of River City Broadcasting out of St. Louis, Missouri, with nine television and 27 radio stations. I was then recruited by Sony, Liberty Media, and two private equity companies to become president of their Spanish language network, Telemundo. In two and a half years, we tripled the profitability of our station group. I was based in Los Angeles, but lived in 10 major U.S. cities, including San Juan, Puerto Rico, while traveling 45 weeks a year. We then successfully sold Telemundo to NBC for $2.7 billion. It was the largest deal in NBC's history by a factor of four. I returned home to Hawaii in 2002 to simultaneously run two failing television stations, KHON2 and KGMB9. Within our first two years, we reversed the financials and ratings. And in 2004 and 2005, KHON was recognized as the number one Fox affiliate in the country. Several years later, after the Great Recession of 2008, we merged the broadcast assets of KGMB, KHNL, and K5 and formed Hawaii News Now. We then went on to build a 21st century multimedia company for Hawaii that was voted by its employees for five straight years as one of the best places to work in Hawaii. Hawaii News Now has also been one of the most highly respected broadcast companies in America, having earned the combined 97 Emmys, Murrows, and Associated Press Awards for broadcast excellence over the past 10 years. Now, during that time, I've also served on 15 community and corporate boards, and to name but a few, the Hawaii Food Bank for 18 years, the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii for six, and I was a trustee for the Public Schools of Hawaii Foundation for 12 years. Oh, I'm sorry, three minutes are up. Keith Amamiya, it is your turn. Thank you very much, Rick. All right. Thank you, Laila, and thank you to the rest of the Kokua Council for this great opportunity. Before I start, I just want to empathize with everyone. This is an unprecedented situation for all of us, this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it's affected everyone greatly, uh, including our seniors. And so uh, I hope everyone is doing the best that they can under these circumstances. And I know that if we stick together, stay together, we will get through this. I'm running for mayor because we need change and a new generation of leadership, one that listens, one that collaborates, and one that brings people together to solve our many complex problems facing Oahu. I was born and raised on Oahu. I've lived here my entire life, and I love Oahu like all of us. And I wanna keep the special things that make Oahu great uh, the same for not only us, but our future generations. And I wanna make it even better than it's ever been. Uh, when I was in high school, I was adopted or hanaied by my best friend's family. And I mentioned that because it was a transformative time of my life. Uh, that family, the Kobayashi family, uh, taught me many values uh, that I live with today. They taught me uh, togetherness, giving back to the community, compassion, empathy, and paying it forward. And I'll be forever indebted to them uh, for the rest of my life. I worked many odd jobs during high school and my college and law school careers. I worked in the cannery, I unpacked uh, and unloaded shipping containers, and I worked as a legal messenger, I worked as a handyman in homes, and did whatever I could to pay the bills and make ends meet and work my way through uh, college and law school. I began my career as an attorney, I was a litigation attorney, and when I was 32 years old, I was hired to run the Hawaii High School Athletic Association. I, uh, I mentioned that job because it was another transformative time of my life. 
As the head of the Hawaii High School Athletic Association, I had the opportunity to go and visit every community across this state, including on Oahu. I met many people from many different walks of life. I learned a lot from them. And what I learned was in particular that they had a hard time making ends meet. They were struggling to pay the bills. This was 20 years ago. And you fast forward today and in this COVID-19 pandemic, these families are still struggling and they're struggling even more than ever before. I'm committed to doing whatever I can as I've done throughout my career to help these people make ends meet and not only survive, but thrive. Uh, in terms of my priorities at the city, it's to get uh, people safe and recovering from this COVID-19 pandemic to make everyone as healthy as possible, to reopen the economy and to take care of our homelessness issue, our lack of affordable housing, uh, and fight climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, before we continue, just to let our timers know, thank you for putting up your 15 second warnings, but we also need an audio signal. Okay, so please provide an audio signal so that the audience and our candidates know that the, a lot of time is almost expiring. Okay, so we're going to begin our debate. Candidates will all, um, alternate as to who will first answer each question. Each candidate will initially have two minutes to respond. After your two minute response and that of your opponents, you will each have an additional minute to rebut your opponent's position or enhance your own. Thereafter, we will go on to the next question. You will be giving a 15 second warning You'll see that sign, handwritten signs that say 15 seconds. Hopefully you will have audio signal too before your allotted time expires. And when it does expire, you will be muted. If you dodge the question or if you digress, we will remind you to answer the question. Okay, so let's start with Cocoa Council Director, Lourdes Scheibert and candidate Keith Amamiya. Lourdes? Hi. I'm Lori Scheiber, and I'm from the island of Kauai, and I'm a, also a volunteer director at my association. So my question is the affordable homes you espouse will most likely be condominiums, but many current condo owners have problems with safety and maintenance issues that should be mitigated by active oversight by the Department of Planning and Permitting, which is currently understaffed. What steps can you take to assure home buyers that when they buy an affordable home, they won't be buying a bottomless money pit? Would you support a condominium ombudsman to assist the Department of Planning and Permitting for condominium owners? Thank you. Yes, of course I'd support a condominium um, ombudsman. Uh, it's important that any condominium homeowner, whether a senior or otherwise, uh, purchases a home that's fit for use. Uh, seniors in particular have uh, issues that maybe other people don't have and it's accessibility, mobility, and safety. Whether it's in the bathroom, uh, whether it's in the shower, or just uh, getting around out and about the house. Uh, we have to make sure that uh, the flooring is safe, or whether it's carpeting or wooden floors or tile floors. So anything that can make the living conditions of seniors and other people safe, uh, I'm in full support of. In terms of the Department of Planning and Permitting, uh, we need to make sure that they process permits and home improvement uh, applications in an as expeditious manner as possible. A lot of times seniors have events where they fall and slip unexpectedly, of course, most of the time, uh, it's not expected, and home modifications need to be made. So. I will work closely with the Department of Planning and Permitting and make sure that these types of modifications are approved on an expedited manner because homeowners, especially seniors, can't afford to wait months, if not a year or more, to get their permits approved. They need the modifications fixed immediately because their health and safety depend on it. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Rick Blanchiardi, your response in two minutes, please. Thank you, Lyle. My apologies for running along. I was trying to cram five decades into an introduction. Won't do that again. 
uh, I would absolutely support that position. I, I think going into the job, one of the things that we know, it's really clear is the Department of Planning and Permitting has been in a great state of dysfunction. Uh, the city did a forensic audit last year. Those results were presented to the mayor uh, at the beginning of this year on January 3rd. I don't know how much of that has been done because of the incidence of COVID, if you will, but clearly from my perspective that uh, you know, all, all, of our, all of our city departments need to look at everything through the lens of our Kapuna, our fastest growing segment of 65 plus. And so we talk about an ombudsman to help a DPP as part of the extension and the revitalization and hopefully the improvement of that, that would be absolute. There's no question that, um, you know, uh, the purchasing a condominium or even, even in a rental situation could become a money pit. And, and there are many, many of the things that go on there that we just need to try to protect our older people. So I, I'm looking forward to the challenge. And I've been told by many that it's a near impossible challenge, but it has to happen under these circumstances as a result of this pandemic to really fix DPP and to really work on the modernization and make it easy for people in need who have complaints or problems or have resources that they have access uh, to, to City Hall. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that and I promise you our directors will be really looking at that with that eye to uh, taking care of our elderly people. So thank you. Thank you, Rick. Keith, um, is there anything that you would like to rebut or enhance in up to one minute? Sure. Another benefit of an ombudsman is that it can re resolve any disputes between a condominium owner and the building management or the association. So that's just another reason that I support having an ombudsman. In terms of the Department of Planning and Permitting, there was a comprehensive audit that was issued earlier this year. And <clears throat> we simply need to follow those recommendations and have the political will. Uh, we've talked about DPP for years but it's time to have leadership that will take the bull by the horns and fix things. And as mayor, I'm committed to do that. Three areas that the Department of Planning and Permitting can improve upon are number one, uh, increase staffing at the DPP. Uh, everyone says that the Department of Planning and Permitting is overworked and uh, they need more resources. Secondly, it's modernize the technology there. The technology is simply outdated. And third, Let's focus on expediting the permits, getting them approved, and uh, increase inspection and compliance. Thank you, Keith. Rick, is there anything that you would like to rebut or enhance in one minute? No, I, I, DPP is gonna be a top priority, and as was just stated by my opponent, you know, the findings are there, it's a great blueprint. I mean, modernization, staffing, even morale, leadership, quite honestly, that's gonna be one of the biggest hires to make. So. We'll stay focused on it. You know, one thing we're really proud of in Hawaii is I get ready to turn 74 tomorrow is we're the national champs on longevity. And if we're not taking care of our kapuna, then, 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 then that's, that's a shame. We need to be able to do, do that job and do that better and make it accessible. And that's going to be a promise of mine. Thank you very much. All right. Well, Rick Langiardi, will you please be the first to respond to Rick Tabor's question? Rick Tabor, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Um, okay, so the pandemic has shifted us back into our cars for health and safety, potentially minimizing the, projected, the projections on the use for the rail system. Um, our tax base might never be the same, compound it with the risk of losing quite a bit of federal money um, um, falling behind on this uh, rail system. What do you as the mayor um, propose and please assure us of some acceptable outcomes for this albatross. Yeah. Well, Rick, you know, what you just sort of alluded to with respect to people's ridership in cars, if you will, you know, that's actually true in the national scene. Public transit is in a debt spiral in 36 of the major U.S. cities. And if you could just envision New York uh, and nobody on subways or all the other transit lines that they have and the impact that that's created into the tune of billions and billions of dollars of debt and unprecedented federal um, you know, funding that's going to be required. So with respect to the rail here, you know, locally, we've invested tremendously, more so than we ever anticipated. The project now is eight or nine years late, billions of dollars over budget. Um, and we've just seen the P3 that was supposed to be announced was not announced. And I just read an article last night uh, in Civil Beat that says it's probably not going to succeed. And there's a lot of expectation here that nothing really will happen other than if there's a change at the, at the level at heart until the next mayor comes in. 
So rail is extremely important for us. Rail is something that we're going to build communities around. We're going to be able to help people, you know, transition and live in a city that allows them to move around. So I, I will tell you, I am going to be very focused on doing everything we can to continue to build rail. The jobs associated with that, but even beyond that, the communities that we get to build and how people live in those communities are of paramount importance. And we've invested far too much money now as the people who live here, you know, to abandon that project. But I am really concerned about the lack of GET revenue. They're already estimating some $400 million additional in debt this year as a result of having no tourists, lack of producing a P3. It's a very ominous situation. But I do think that when we get the rail built, okay, and I believe in the project from the beginning, it's going to be a very important dynamic to the future of Hawaii and of this island, Oahu. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Keith, your response in two minutes, please. Well, like everyone, I'm just as frustrated, if not upset at times, about the status of the rail project from the pre-planning purpose uh, stages up to the present. But having said that, we need to do what we can to finish the rail project all the way through Ala Moana. And if possible, even extend it past Waikiki and to the University of Hawaii like it was originally intended. Uh, in terms of the rail project, uh, we can't afford to return the $800 million that the federal government gave us in subsidies already for the rail project. We promised the federal government that we'd finish rail at Ala Moana, and if we don't, we face the risk of having to return $800 million. That's money the sim city simply doesn't have. The federal government is also willing to give $700 more million towards the rail project as a subsidy. So that's another factor to consider. But the bottom line is, to be, in order to be as great a city as we can be, we need multiple modes of transportation. Not everyone can afford a car. Not everyone can drive in a car. We need to lower the traffic. We need to make it easier for people, especially those uh, with lower incomes from the west side of Oahu, uh, an efficient, economical, clean energy way to get into town. So we need to do what we can to finish the rail project as originally intended. Another benefit of rail is transit-oriented development. People forget about the huge benefit, billions of dollars in construction and economic development that'll be a result of the transit-oriented development. I liken the 21 rail stations to be cities within a city. And along the rail line, there's other opportunities to build uh, and, and help our economy. At each rail station, we could build affordable housing. We could add retail. We could add uh, commercial development. So all in all, uh, rail needs to be completed to Ala Moana as originally planned. Thank you, Keith. Rick, is there anything that you'd like to rebut or en enhance your question and uh, your answer? Uh, in one thank you, Lila. I, I, I do. I mean, I think we could probably talk about rail for quite some time. I think we both share an opinion that it's absolutely essential. Uh, if ever, I think in going forward, the next mayor is going to be challenged with strong leadership and tough decision making, you know, in fiscal responsibility. It is going to be on the subject of rail. So I'm actually a little bit less concerned about our having to return $800 million. I want to continue with the project. More concerned about what is it going to take to trigger the $744 million the feds are still holding to enable us to continue on. So, look, there's a lot at risk here. There's a lot at stake. There's a lot that's been invested. And there's a future in front of us that really needs this project is for building communities, for ridership, for all kinds of reasons. So in that regard, this will be the biggest challenge. I asked Mayor Caldwell before I went public about becoming mayor, what kept him up at night? And the first thing he said was rail. And I can understand why. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Keith, is there anything that you'd like to add or rebut in one minute? Yes. So studies in other cities show that about 35% of rail ridership or public transportation ridership is age 55 and above. So rail is an important transportation option for seniors. And so that's yet another reason why I'm strongly in favor of completing the rail project as intended. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm very mindful of the costs of rail. And as mayor, I will keep a keen eye to make sure that the mistakes the delays and the cost overruns that have plagued the rail project up to this point don't happen anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Keith, stay there. Uh, Keith, will you please be the first to respond to Helen Wagner's question? Helen, are you ready?
Helen. Mm -hmm. Helen, if you're there, are you ready? Yeah, uh, I've unmuted myself and things, but can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Helen, please give a question to T. That's question number okay. three. Describe the steps you will be taking to regain the respect and trust of the people. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's important that, uh, that respect and trust uh, and integrity starts with the top. As your mayor, I will lead like I've always done throughout my career with integrity, uh, with trust and with character. I will surround myself with like-minded people and I'll have zero tolerance for the corruption and other problems that have plagued the city over the past several years. Another area that I will work on and focus on to restore the public's trust and confidence in city government is to create an office of community engagement. As I've mentioned in previous forums, that'll be an important office that'll go out in the community and actively and proactively listen, learn, and talk to the community members all across Oahu as to the issues and challenges and concerns that they have about the city. Too often lately, the government, whether it's on the city, state, or even the federal government, have done a less than stellar job of listening to the public. And that's why there's a lot of dissatisfaction and mistrust with government. I'm going to change that. I'm going to restore that. As I've done throughout my career, I've actively listened, learned, and engaged in meaningful dialogue with the community before even proposing anything major in a particular community. I'll continue to do that as mayor, and that, again, is to listen, learn, and engage. Thank you, Keith. Rick, your response in two minutes, please. Well, I, I actually you know, believe that this is gonna be one of the real priorities for us as mayor to demonstrate to the public is to gain their trust, so it will be a priority. I'm actually excited about the fact that the prosecutor's office, which I think has really been a liability the running of the city has been what it's become. Uh, and so Keith Kaneshiro is having stayed as long as he has. I've been encouraged to listen to the debates between Steve Arm and Megan Cow and all that they, they, they hold for that. But I think more than anything, and how you build trust in the organizations I've run, it's through your actions, it's what you do, it's the kind of decision making, it's the consistency of that. It is about being transparent, it is about being accessible. And while I hear what my opponents talking about as far as the board, I would actually like to propose something a little bit different, which on two different levels, I'd like to kind of create hubs to create accessibility. So can, people can, can feel that they're in touch in each of the council districts. And in fact, I'd like to even go one step further since the city owns land in all of those districts and whether or not we can actually create offices for the councils in each of the district to provide greater accessibility. I think that's part of the problem is that if people can't communicate or if there's a lack of transparency or they don't have accessibility, the things begin to break down and things start to look top down and they don't really understand the decisions. So I'm a strong advocate for building trust. You build that through your actions, not just in your words and the consistency of those actions. And also really understanding what the real needs of people and the priority and giving them their dignity. That's gonna be a big part of taking office is regaining trust in that in the mayor's office. So I thank you. Thank you. Um, Keith, is there anything that you'd like to add or rebut? You have up to one minute. Well, as I mentioned before, my career has been based on public service and uh, it, was, it was probably uh, more evident than ever while I ran the High School Athletic Association. I did go to every community and I found it very effective to meet with everybody in every community, whether it's Larry Ginoza in Waianae, Alex Kane in Kailua, uh, Twinkle Borge in Waianae, Junior IU in Kahuku, uh, and on and on. Uh, it's important to meaningfully engage with people, whether it's in the garage or a high school cafeteria, a high school gym. Uh, I've done that before, and I'll continue to do that as mayor. I'll be able to hit the ground running as mayor because I'm very familiar with each of the communities on a very intimate basis. 
And so I will reach out to those people from day one to solve our city's problems. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Rick, is there anything that you'd like to add or rebut? Yeah, I'd just like to add something, not so much as a rebuttal, but I just finished a 43-year career in broadcast in running big major news operations, not the least of which was Hawaii News Now. In our business, trust is the holy grail. You know, I've worked for public and privately held companies throughout my whole career, but the thing we have in common is that we're really a quasi-governmental agency and that we hold broadcast licenses with the FCC that mandate that we operate in the public trust. And so, for example, when you're doing the amount of work we did, and not even talking about the community outreach or PSAs, just in the newscast alone, when you're doing 41 hours of news a week, in order to build a confidence of people, you've got to be accurate because every one of those minutes, if we're wrong, is a lawsuit waiting to happen. So when you can build trust and you see in seminal moments how people turn to you, whether it was a missile scare or a hurricane or something threatening it, and they come to you in disproportionate ways, that's what it's all about. That's what I've lived with for the last four plus decades is building trust in communities and especially in this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Okay, Rick, will you still hold on? Um, Rick Blangiotti will be the first to respond to Kathy Wyatt's question. Good morning. Um, during this pandemic, it's obvious that our leaders are not working in tandem to try to get the pandemic under control. Uh, how would you work with the governor, the health department, and the other leaders to show a solid front so that your citizens don't hear different guidelines and mixed messages? That's a great question because I've been, I've really been somewhat amazed at the inconsistency, if you will, and the fact that we've had different voices and, and quite honestly, the lack of cohesion and communication. I want to go back again to my broadcast career. I've been in the business of disseminating important life-saving information numerous times really matters that, that you can save lives. And we were very careful about making sure that our communication was clear, complete, and easy to understand. You know, this has been really amazing to watch. I, I tried not to second guess our elected officials, but I have said publicly, the communication that was be, that's been behind what's happened has, has not been good. It's not been good at all. And it's come to the detriment of of the people who live here. So even to this day right now, all it's doing is compounding fear and uncertainty. And the ground rules have been inconsistent and everything else about it. So I would clearly want to get together with the governor. I'm going to be a newly elected mayor um, and, and everybody else, the major stakeholders as how we work through this pandemic. But you've got to understand for all that we're talking about in this last question, even on trust, communication, what you say to people, especially in times of duress, the clarity of thought, is absolutely essential. So I, I would make sure we did everything possible so that we didn't add to the panic, the confusion and the fear, because we're gonna have to come from that if we're gonna create hope in our people. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Keith, your response in two minutes, please. Oh, sorry. Yes. Well, clearly there's been a lack of communication between the various government entities and uh, as mayor, I will make sure that the communication improves. Throughout my career, I've mentioned that communication is important. Transparency is important. Working together as a team is important. So I would act no differently when I'm the mayor uh, to make sure that communication is improved. In terms of one specific uh, action that could help things, uh, in terms of the city and its response to COVID-19, the city is, uh, and County of Honolulu is the only county without a district health officer. Uh, that position would be a great liaison between the city and the state to communicate better and make sure that the miscommunications that have been taking place uh, up to this point in terms of dealing with COVID-19 doesn't happen again. In terms of how to address COVID-19, uh, we need to take three major steps. Number one, make Oahu COVID safe again and that involves rigorous testing, contact tracing, and isolation and quarantining where necessary. Uh, that seems obvious, but for whatever reason, it hasn't really happened up to this point. We also need to address the needs of the struggling individuals and businesses. Uh, there's a lot of CARES money that's been provided to the city and county of Honolulu. I believe $387 million from the CARES Act uh, that money needs to get out to the struggling families and businesses at a much faster pace. Uh, 
based on yesterday's Star Advertiser article, I believe only about $70 million of that amount has been passed out. Uh, we have till the end of December to distribute all that money and time is running out and people are struggling while we're speaking. The third item we need to do is to look at post-COVID economic opportunities. We've been over-reliant on tourism for far too long. It's time we diversify the economy for once and for all with agriculture, aquaculture, and renewable energy. Thank you, Keith. Rick Blanchiardi, is there anything that you would like to rebut or enhance in up to one minute? No, I, I think that um, we, we've covered this topic. This is um, something of, of, of real importance. And I don't want to I don't want to be redundant. There's just a lot of work to do here. I, I do want to echo what my opponent just said about the fact that we really are failing miserably, in my opinion, at being able to distribute the funds to people who really need the money, and especially right now in this protracted uh, lockdown as well. So we need to be very, very sensitive to that. Government should be doing everything it possibly can to put money in the hands of people because they need it to live on. There's nothing casual about what's going on. This is what absolute essential so people can survive. We need to be mindful of that. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Keith, is there anything else that you would like to add or rebut? I would just add that I have a specific plan to lead Oahu on the road to recovery. It's called my Oahu Recovery Plan, and it focuses on three areas, healthy people, healthy economy, and healthy environment. Uh, everyone has plans, but it's, uh, it's up to the mayor to make sure that those plans are executed. And as mayor, I'll make sure that it happens. Um, there's been enough talk through this COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, and even in the years and decades before uh, in the mayor's office, it's timely, finally time that we take action on this serious problem. Thank you very much, Keith. Okay, Keith, will you also be the first to respond to Helen Wagner's next question? Helen, are you ready for us? And the video. Helen, you're on. Question number. Oh, okay, and you have my video off too. That's okay. all right. Okay. How do you do campaign donations and endorsements influence your policies? Who has donated to your campaign and how does your strategies align with their missions? Will public testimony influence your decision? How do you formulate your decisions? Thank you, Helen. Well, that's a multi-pronged question, so I'll try to answer them uh, sequentially as, as best I can. Uh, how I'm gonna lead the city and county of Honolulu is through listening, learning and getting meaningful dialogue and feedback from people. So in terms of public testimony, of course, I will factor that in uh, into my decision-making process. It's important to get the public's feedback on issues of concern impacting the city, and I welcome that. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Office of Community Engagement that I'm proposing will actively go out into every community and get feedback and input from our citizens all across Oahu before any important decisions or even proposals are brought to the table. In terms of political donations, I'm very fortunate to get a broad cross-section of donors from the community, whether it's the business community or whether it's everyday individuals. Uh, I've, I've been fortunate to receive broad-based support. I have a community-powered campaign. It's reflected in the strength of my grassroots team who, many of whom are younger people, many of whom are first time volunteers and first time voters. They're excited, I'm excited about the opportunity to bring meaningful change to the city and county of Honolulu Mayor's Office. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Rick Blanchiardi, your response in two minutes, please. Thank you, Lila. Well, I've always looked at this job and I've positioned myself as this in this job as a leadership role. And it was incumbent upon me going back to trust, to establish that presence, if you will, and that confidence in the people who stepped forward to endorse me. So I've been very proud of the fact that I received Shopo's endorsement, you know, from, from the police department, the men who's, and women who have sworn to serve and protect, you know, and then that's extended recently to the engineers 
then the carpenters, the carpenters union, the, you know, the engineers, operators, three operating engineers, and, and ILWU. I mean, I took all this stuff with great pride, labor, hardworking people. And in those conversations, I'll be very clear with you, not that I've gotten the benefit of any real money. It's all, and it made it really clear, was there a quid, quid pro quo expectation? And there's never been any conversation like that. It was about really helping you, helping me become elected so I could be the leader that they needed to be, that they could rely on, no matter how difficult the storm ahead is going to be. I, I offer my background and, and experiences and the reputation that I've established in this town through a lot of years of hard work. So there's not any quid pro quo. And if you look at the campaign spending commission, quite honestly, halfway through this, I funded more than half the revenue myself out of my personal savings. So I haven't, I'm not beholden to anybody and nobody has asked me to be beholden to them. And all they've asked me to do is to do a good job as the leader of the city and coming into a situation unlike, and I know you cited some other mayors, but this job for us, either one of us going into it is unlike anything anybody's ever seen before or done before. And this is where the experience is gonna pay off. And this is where our ability to, to collaborate and communicate and build confidence to innovate, all of those things are gonna be very, very important from a leadership standpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Keith, Amalia, is there anything that you'd like to rebut or enhance up to a minute? The only people I'll be beholden to are the everyday citizens of the city and county of Honolulu. Uh, that's what I've said from the beginning and that's what I'll do as your mayor. In terms of public engagement and public testimony and, and getting as much information as possible, I think COVID-19 has taught us that uh, we can testify or we can communicate virtually or digitally. Uh, I, when I was on the Board of Education uh, for several years, I always wondered and questioned why can't we get testimony uh, via uh, Skype or, or FaceTime or, or other means or now Zoom. Um, it's proven with this pandemic that you can communicate virtually and that you don't have to physically be in the city council chambers, for example, to testify. We need to make it as easy as possible for the public to express their concerns about an issue and technology is one of the ways we can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Rick Blanchiotti, is there anything that you'd like to add or rebut? Yeah, in yeah I'd like to add a, a little bit more on that. You know, I uh, started off today, which is unprecedented for me in these Zoom calls, trying to give a little bit more depth to my resume, my actual experience and, and what I've learned along the way and what I've and what I've earned along the way as well in the way of respect and trust. So I will tell you that um, this is a good time probably to talk about what our campaign slogan of it's about you because where that comes from and how it's perceived because it really is a statement on servant leadership. And, and at the end of the day, for me, it's always been about putting others first. It starts first and foremost with my family. There are lots of people who've worked for me in this town that will attest to that. It put my employees first and certainly the various stakeholders I had in ownership groups and whatever. But the biggest thing of all, and what I've done, and I alluded to it earlier in the 1980s, with, whether it was UH Sports or what we just created in building a 21st century multimedia company for Hawaii, it has always been about putting the people of Hawaii first. And that's been true in everything we've done, not just in, our, in what we did, the cultural issues we've covered and everything else in between. So I'm really proud of that. And, and, and that's where I'm coming from. And I think it's been well responded to and the people who've endorsed me. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rick. Okay, Rick, will you be the first first to respond to Doug Matsuoka's question? Hi, uh, I'm H. Doug Matsuoka. I'm on the volunteer board here at uh, Kokua Council. Uh, I work for Hawaii Meals on Wheels and I participate in uh, Food Not Bombs, which feeds uh, people in the street. Also founding a member of Hawaii Guerrilla Video Hui. Uh, my own experience with homelessness in 2014 informs some of my questions, particularly uh, this one. Um, you both acknowledge uh, the lack of affordable housing as a major problem. Now, 13 states have or allow some form of rent control. Are you willing to consider rent control as a method for making housing more affordable? And also, what other ideas for making rent control affordable rent control yes and no i you know that's a very complicated subject i want to learn more about it but part of me right now would say yes a strong part i would lean towards that it would be hard to convince me otherwise 
because right now at the end of the day, everything we've talked about, I've talked about is building affordable rental units. I don't even know what the word affordable means anymore in the context of people's living arrangements. So uh, as you know, because we've met before, I've done a lot of work on homelessness, but to the point of what you're asking about, um, we have to create places for people to live that they can actually afford afford to live in. You know, we, we leave the country, you're all familiar with the Alice Report, people living paycheck to paycheck. We've seen in this pandemic how many businesses have not been able to sustain, how many have closed because they barely can go month to month, they didn't have the reserve. Where are people going to live? So, you know, there's, there's a, a whole lot to be said about, you know, our homeless situation, but we have really a big population of at-risk homeless. And part of that is the, the circumstances of the pandemic, but the other part of it is providing affordable rental units. So uh, that, the other day we talked about the minimum wage. I've been a strong proponent of the minimum wage prior. I usually had it on my website, but then in this pandemic, I don't know how feasible that is. And so the offset and where I've turned to is thinking more and more because between employers and employee, that's gonna have to be separate. How can we give people a place to live? We're gonna to have to build places, which I believe we can do in the urban core. I've talked to developers. There's some great plans and ideas. And even going back to DPP and what we need to do to make that more efficient to create affordable living. So if we can do that, then we'll see it's a what level of income we're talking about as far as rent control. But I think there's a lot more we can do to put roofs over people's heads in places where they can actually afford to pay for it. So it's a big deal with me, big deal, Doug. Thank you, Rick. Keith Amamiel, your response in two minutes, please. All right, thanks for the question, Doug. And, and real quickly, food not bombs. I've, I've helped serve meals by uh, Thomas Square with, uh, I believe, Puna Sateishi. So uh, that's a great program and good job on that. In terms of rent control, you know, I, I don't know if I support or oppose it at this point, but I think you and I have the same goal, and that's to lower the cost of housing here on Oahu. Um, that's the bottom line, whether it's through rent control or other means, uh, we need to do whatever we can to lower the skyrocketing out of control housing prices here on Oahu. I'm the first and only candidate to have a comprehensive housing for all plan that seeks to uh, dramatically decrease and address the 22,000 unit shortage we have here on Oahu. There's three main areas of my housing for all plan. Number one, focus on housing for Oahu residents and not out of state residents. Number two, curb the activities that inflate the cost of housing like the 8,000 illegal vacation rentals that are still here on Oahu. And number three is to encourage private development of housing, particularly in the urban core whether that's through zoning variances, higher building uh, uh, levels, whether it's providing infrastructure like sewer, utility, and water to incentivize developers to build in the urban core, I'm all for that. In terms of the housing that I think you're looking for, Doug, yes, the city needs to and will do more if I'm the next mayor. We need to build more affordable rentals. Uh, my campaign headquarters, is in Kaka'ako and half a block away is the Nale Hulu Senior Rental Project. It's a low income senior rental project. It's a very successful project that the city's done uh, and I'm gonna do more of that as mayor. I also talk about Kahoiki Village when I have my another minute in a, a minute. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you Keith. All right, Rick Blanchiardi, is there anything that you'd like to rebut or enhance it? I think it's just about enhancing. I think we could talk about this subject. It's so important. So I really kind of want to want to just say, I, and I said this before when I spoke to you, it's one of the things that I really believe in. There's an old adage that says that a society is judged by how it treats its most vulnerable. So in this particular case, as I already alluded to the fact this morning that the uh, Kapuna are the fastest growing segment of our population in 65 plus, that is a big at-risk community given given the lack of affordability in rental units or for that matter anything that's increasing the cost of living i know in my building they recently changed i live in a condominium right next to thomas square and they changed the lease laws and a bunch of people who are on fixed incomes had to move out so doug that's part of my interest in seeing that what happens when you're in a fixed income then all of a sudden the, the numbers change and you can't handle that that's why i have a tendency to say you have to talk me out of looking at that so this is a complicated subject it's a big one and if we're going to be successful as mayors, this would be a great thing to do for the people who live here. Thank you.
Thank you, Rick. Keith Amamiya, here's your extra minute to respond. So as I was going to say, we, we need to be creative and we can't just focus on traditional housing, as they say. And, and my emphasis will be on the lower spectrum of housing that hasn't really been given the attention it needs. I mentioned Kahawiki Village. That's a perfect example of a public-private partnership involving the state, the city, the nonprofit sector, and the private sector. It's a community that houses 144 previously homeless families, 600 people in all, including 300 children. I mentioned the Lower Income Senior Rentals Project, but I also want to look at uh, other types of housing that simply are not as expensive as traditional housing, whether that's communal housing, where everyone has their own room. It's a dorm style type of housing where you have a central kitchen and a central living room area to keep the cost down. I'm also in favor of building condominiums or apartments with micro units, very tiny units. A lot of people don't need a lot of space, in fact, prefer less space. So I'm in favor of looking at every and all options to address our homelessness and housing issue. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Okay, please hold on, Keith, because you'll be the first to respond to Rick Taper's question. Rick, are you ready? I'm ready. Um, all right, so the COVID, uh, thank you guys. Thank you for joining us again. And I, I didn't in the first time introduce myself. So I'm, I'm actually the vice president with the Kakua Council. I'm also in the Rotary Club of Honolulu. Rick, you've spoken there recently. And within that, I'm the chair of the uh, Kapuna Kakua Council. A lot goes on with all of that. And I'm secretary with Hawaii Meals on Wheels and the go, list goes on, but that's real quick. Um, so a question that, that we thought of that, that I think is very, very important and I'd like us to address it is the COVID, the COVID pandemic naturally has changed everything, including your strategic plans that you started with. Tell us your new strategic plan for what you're going to do when you're in office, the first 100 days you're in office, the first year you're in office, and the first term. And for each of those, we'd like you to name three specific policies. We're looking for specifics here. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Wow, that's a lot. So uh, I'll do my best to uh, answer them uh, in sequential order. Well, and let me go back to the, the previous question on rail and just quickly say that, yes, ridership is down right now, but hopefully this pandemic is going to end and that ridership will increase again uh, to what it was before, if not greater, once rail is built. But in terms of what I'm going to do in the first 100 days, uh, it's pretty much what we've been talking about uh, for the past 45 minutes or so. Uh, number one, we need to reduce the spread of COVID-19 uh, across Oahu. Uh, without healthy people, we can't have a healthy economy. We, uh, so that's number one. Number two, we need to reopen the economy as quickly as possible. A lot of people have been out of jobs, especially in the tourism industry, for about six months or even more. Uh, we need to get people back to work. Uh, number three, we need to build more affordable housing. Four, reduce homelessness. And five, enact a climate action plan. Climate change is something that's being forgotten during this pandemic, but we need to address that now. Uh, that is a crisis of our lifetime, as I've said before. And unless we address it now, we are leaving our future generations with a lot of issues that may not be fixable by the time they're our age. Uh, in terms of Addressing the COVID situation, um, I think you want 100 day game plan. Well, we need to get as much money to individuals and small businesses as possible. The city is doing its best to get that money out there, whether it's in the form of rent relief uh, or, or basic food subsidies, uh, but uh, they just have to get out there quicker. It's, it's taking too long and people are suffering. Thank you, Keith. So, so, Rick, would you repeat that question? Because there's a lot to that, okay? Go ahead, please. All right. All right, so the COVID pandemic has changed everything, including your original strategic plan. Tell us your new strategic plan for your first 100 days in office, your first year, and your first term by naming three specific policies and changes for each. We're looking yeah. for specifics. You, you stayed up late last night drawing that question up. Huh? That's, oh, I wrote this a while ago. <laughs> okay, I got it. Okay, well, well, let me just say that um, the priorities we started out with and the issues that I thought would be of real importance as a mayor are still in existence 
from the standpoint of uh, the rail, homelessness, our infrastructure issues, neighborhood safety, et cetera. But everything now has been amplified, as you just pointed out, Rick, as a result of the pandemic. And so suddenly a conversation we're having now uh, about rebuilding our economy, trying to keep businesses from closing, keeping roofs over people's heads, all of that has been changed as a result of that pandemic. So I think we're going to have to lean into that and tackle that as best as possible. But I think going into office, something's really become very clear, for me at least as a leader. First and foremost, it's going to be about who's going to run City Hall. Who are the people who are going to keep on our team? The people that are going to be there, the men and women, people who already exist there, people that we're going to have to find and put in place. We already alluded to the fact that DPP needs a change in leadership, et cetera. That's number one. Secondly, the mayor's office is saddled with producing a budget for 22 two months after we get into office. So figuring that out and figuring out really, quite honestly, the back half of this budget and what happens. Now, the city should be pretty well insulated on property taxes based on the evaluations. But at the end of the day, the possibilities here, people not paying, the hotels have not, they're all on installment plans. The hotels have not had any revenue. People are out of work. We're presupposing a lot of stuff there. So that's going to take shape in how we look at the 22 budget. So it would be, you know, it would be the team. It would be the 22 budget right away because that's your really your policy statement. The things that we say we're going to do are going to be tied to those numbers. From, and that's going to be really important, not anything casual. And I want our team around this. And then, you know, and I think the other thing is, as I've said before, DPP, for everything that we want to talk about housing and everything else, it's all about that and getting that fixed as quickly as possible so we can trigger jobs and activities that we really need to help this economy rebuild. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Keith, Amani, is there anything that you'd like to add or, or rebut in up to one minute? Sure. If anything, uh, what I do in the first 100 days is, is increase my focus on those that are most vulnerable in our communities. They were vulnerable before COVID. They're even more vulnerable now. For example, our Pacific Islanders, uh, they are suffering from a disproportionately high rate of COVID-19 infections. Uh, they need our help. Um, they need services. They need uh, the contact tracing to minimize the continued spread uh, of COVID-19. And they're one of the groups that are have the highest unemployment rate and the highest poverty rates. So I would focus on them. I would also focus on seniors. They're another vulnerable category, uh, especially those that are uh, less able or less mobile to get around. Um, COVID-19 has highlighted the challenges that they're facing, whether it's access to food, access to health care, and the like. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Rick Blanchiardi, is there anything like you'd like to add? Or I, just want, I want to add something, too, because uh, one thing that's become apparently clear, and we've already talked about it several times, people need money. People really need money. And so I'm really curious what's happening in D.C. with the HEROES Act and all that's pending. And I would intend to go to Washington as the mayor of the city and county of Honolulu and fight for as much money as we can possibly get in this piece of legislation because we're going to need every penny of it. As we have said earlier, the lament is the monies we have right now, the $387 million is not even being parceled out correctly. And so we're going to need to do that. Let's face it, at the end of the day, jobs and everything else that we need to repair ourselves with is going to be federally induced. And the feds are going to have to protect a place like Honolulu. I want to be at the table fighting for every possible nickel we can get for the city and county of Honolulu and the people who live here. Thank you, Rick. Okay, Rick, will you please take Rick, Neighbor, uh, Rick Tabor's next question. Rick? All right, so this one, Rick, kept me up at night. Do you have any ethical issues with your opponent? And if so, please share your concerns. No, I, you know what? That's a tough question. I don't have any ethical, I, you know, I've always liked Keith. He and I have had a relationship in the past. Uh, this whole thing about running against each other can get a little bit tense at times. I've promised civility in my campaign. I promise respect for all the candidates. I've tried to demonstrate that to Keith. We only had one conversation where things got a little bit heated between us. Um, but the fact is that he's in the position he's in because he's an ethical man. A lot of people have seen that. They believe that. And so that's why the two of us are running um, for mayor. So I, I don't, um, you know, I don't have any reason to say anything otherwise. And I would hope he feels the same way, but I'm not going to put words in his mouth. So let's turn it over to him and let's see what he has to say. Thank you, Rick. Keith? 
I mean, I, I want to just focus on the issues. I think that's what my opponent wants. That's what the public wants. Uh, and, and let's just, you know, uh, uh, focus on what's important to the communities. Uh, no one wants, 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 wants uh, you know, mudslinging or dirt. They, they're, they want to see what we're going to do to make our city better. We're in the midst of an economic catastrophe, if you will, caused by COVID-19. And so we need to focus our efforts on what we can do to get us out of this economic catastrophe, how we're going to help the people that are most vulnerable, uh, and how we're going to move our city forward. And that's what I'm focused on in this campaign, and that's what I'll fo be focused on as mayor. Thank you, Keith. Rick, is there anything that you'd like to add? No, just, just a slight change. You know, yes, COVID-19 has caused what we're going through, but part of it also has been some of our, of our decision making, as we said earlier, in our elected leaders and, and elsewhere, that's actually caused even more economic harm than, than maybe we should be experiencing. And I mean that in the context of closing down businesses that really I think should be considered essential, have been deemed non-essential and closed. And it's come to a place where it's caused many of these businesses to close and many more thinking about it. So going back to the responsibility in leadership right now in a midst of a crisis like this, that decision-making, the things that get thought of, you know, I'd be the last guy to want to commit economic suicide, public safety, public health. Yes, we have our borders closed to tourists, but we've got to be able to provide for the commerce and the place that we live and the small businesses that, that, that make Hawaii what it is, this island what it is. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Keith, is there anything else that you'd like to add? I'll just reemphasize that we're in a severe crisis and it'll take leadership that's collaborative, that brings people together and that works together with all different interest groups. We don't need top-down leadership, we need collaborative leadership. Uh, we need leadership that has plans, whether it's my Housing for All plan or my Oahu Recovery Plan. And we also need leadership that is understanding of and has worked with in the past all different sectors of our community, all different sectors of our government. Running the city is a very complex task. You need the ability to work as an executive uh, and it certainly doesn't hurt that I've had the experience and background in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. I've also worked with the city uh, a lot in my career. I've worked with government sector unions a lot, and those skill sets and experience will help me be best prepared to be your next mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. All right. Um, Keith, will you be the first to respond to Dale Head's question? Dale? Good morning and welcome. I appreciate your right for public service. It's wonderful. See, my name is Dale Head. I'm a 70 years old retiree out in Makaha. My working career was blue collar, mostly at Pearl Harbor Shipyard, military service with the Army. Also, I spent over a decade on a condo board of directors. We have this old saying back there. Most people are two missed paychecks away from being homeless. In condo world, I know that retirees are just two missed monthly payment fees away from losing their, their home. So I have a simple question for you today. Okay, you each are new at running for elective office, but have close ties to networks of people who are very influential. Of the various stakeholder groups, such as downtown businesses, our construction industry, government employees, private sector unions, tourism, the military, healthcare, or others. To which are you most connected? Thank you. Well, thank you for the question, Dale. And uh, I was at Makaha a couple weekends ago and you live in God's country. It's a beautiful place. Uh, in terms of my connections, uh, you know, I've been fortunate throughout my career to have networks and relationships with all the groups you mentioned, but my most cherished uh, affinity or association with people across Oahu is, is working class people, is with uh, everyday people in all of those communities. Uh, it's important to be an effective mayor that you have these connections and relationships 
with people that you mentioned, but of course the communities as well. Uh, I've done that throughout my career and I'll continue to do that as mayor is reach out to the communities, work with the communities. They're the reason I'm running. Uh, I'm running because I'm concerned about the state of our city. I'm concerned about people's struggles to make ends meet. I'm concerned about everyone's quality of life. Uh, before COVID, uh, people were stuck in traffic, it seemed half the time. Uh, many people are two paychecks, if not one paycheck away from financial catastrophe. I wanna improve the lot of everyday people and I'll focus on them uh, when I become your next mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Rick Blanchiotti, your response in two minutes, please. Thanks. Well, first of all, Dale, I want to acknowledge, you know, your service and your background. And let me just say that um, I grew up in a bilingual household in Cambridge, Massachusetts. My mother was the youngest of nine. My father was the oldest of seven. Italian was spoken more than English. I was the first in my family to go to college. My father was a machinist and it was in 1965 where he was working at the Watertown Hospital. It was closed and he was offered a transfer to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And my mother was, again, the youngest of nine and an Italian family really wanted to come and that's what changed my destiny. And I was the first in my family to go to college. I won a scholarship playing football to be able to do that. My origins, my belief systems, where I am, where I come from is rooted in that upbringing and continues to be so today. Now I happen to enjoy, because I've been in a high profile job, the company of a lot of people in this town that's been part of trying to be a leader in the private sector was to engage as many people as possible. When I, when I hear you phrase the question you do about connections as if something nefarious was going on, I don't know if that's the case. I think right now going forward, this has been a very humbling impact on all of us. And we're gonna need the private sector across the board and everybody pulling together. I'm really concerned about the potential people defection of, could be upwards of 35,000 people leaving Hawaii because of no work or all of the other things that we're gonna experience and are experiencing. So right now, I would tell you, we're gonna need everybody, and I'm hoping to be able to leverage the connections I do have across the board in every sector, from bank CEOs all the way down to people in nonprofit organizations and everything in between you can possibly imagine as a collaborator, as a communicator, as somebody that inspires hope that gets us going in the right direction. So the connections are gonna be powerful, I think, to help make things happen because there is a future and we've got to go after it. And that's what the leadership of and being mayor is going to be all about. Thank you, Rick. Keith, is there anything that you'd like to add or rebut in the next minute? I'll just add that you need to look no further than my campaign team to show that I have a broad based uh, level of support from community leaders uh, and not big business or or other special interest groups that people may be concerned about should I become mayor. I have uh, affordable housing advocates, uh, social workers, healthcare advocates, and many, many more. Um, it's, it's a very diverse group, um, you know, and uh, of many different uh, subsets of our community. Uh, they're younger than me, uh, and they're smarter than me, um, and they're very concerned about the welfare of our city as well. And I'm lucky that I have them as part of my team. And, and um, I will continue to do what I've done throughout my career and as, to have as diverse a group of people as possible with all one underlying factor. They all care about our community and want to make it better. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Rick, is there anything that you would like to add? Or yeah, I do. I want to offer, I kind of want to offer a perspective, if you will, because I mean, candidly speaking, Hawaii doesn't really have big business. You know, I know all of these men and women running these various various places, and, and some of them Rick are in your, in your Rotary Club. You know, I, I left the mainland. I came home in 2002 because I got tired of dealing with people who had absolutely no soul but were in powerful business places who cared nothing about the people or anything that they did in their business decisions. I find Hawaii to be a very engaging place. I'm gonna say it again. We do have an aloha spirit. It even exists at the highest levels of business leaders in this town. And it's about tapping into that, tapping into that resource. We're gonna need that. And all the way down through in government and the people that we bring in to help run government is all a very exciting time. So I'm someone who drawing on the words of Winston Churchill, you never wanna waste a good crisis. This pandemic has teed us up to do some great things in the days and weeks ahead. And I'm very excited about those possibilities. Thank you.
Thank you, Rick. All right, will you please be the first to answer Rick Tabor's next question? Okay. Is there a, is there a quota on questions from Rick Tabor? <laughs> Go ahead, Rick, I'm sorry. No, not at all. Um, the quota is, this is my last one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. So you guys are very, very similar, and you're both running on the Community First Strategies, haven't held a uh, government office before, as we said earlier, um, and you're both very successful businessmen in your own rights, which is uh, you know, very impressive. Could you talk about what differentiates you from your opponent? Why would we vote for you over? Yeah. The, Okay, well, I, you know, I, that's why today I wanted to outline my actual business experience because I have led big companies, hundreds, thousands of people over the years working big, you know, I've been in positions where I work for a really tough ownership groups, both public and private, as I alluded, um, always had to generate profit, even for that matter, going back to the old days of KHNL, I literally used to drive around town doing cash calls to get paid, to get, pick up money from the ownership group so I could make payroll. So I've always been in a situation where I've worked in the public trust as a broadcaster, even though it was even true as a football coach, but in the public trust at serving the community about at the same time running organizations, developing profit margins, improving profitability, creating something of value, if you will, very people intensive. In addition to that, I really do have extensive work in the nonprofit sector and I've been you know, in leadership roles in the nonprofit sector, was the chair of the chamber I alluded to earlier, president of the Boy Scouts, president of NACO, I've been on every nonprofit, I've had extended stay and extended leadership roles, all designed to, as a volunteer, to help contribute to this place. So my body of work is unique to me. I'm not gonna compare it to Keith. It's just unique to me. I bring five decades of real success in tough situations. I alluded briefly to Telemundo. That was incredible to build a Spanish language net network that was totally upside down with very tough ownership groups and do what we did. I can tell you, there's articles in the in industry trades that says, you know, it was the greatest turnaround in the history of television. On the heels of that, I came back to Hawaii. Everybody thought I was crazy. What are you doing with your resume? I was in a peak position to stay there. I came back home in 2002, as I said, and took over a couple of broken television stations, reversed those fortunes, and all that I know that it would lead to it's the last chapter, which I'm very proud of. So it's, it's really about what I've done and what I've given to this place and my love of this place in, my, in the context of me. And that's what I have to offer. Thank you, Rick. Keith, your response, please. I've been on the campaign trail for over a year now, and it's been extremely beneficial to me because I've been able to go into every community and hear their respective concerns and issues. It gave me a good foundation for what they need or what they'd like to see in government and what they'd like to see in their next mayor. In terms of my background and experience, I kind of went over it before, but to resummarize, um, I've worked in big business as well. And I worked uh, in an executive capacity at one of Hawaii's largest companies. Uh, it's a billion dollar company. But I've also had experience working with government. And I think that's important too. Working in government is a very different experience. It's a diff very different skill set that you need uh, when it comes to working with government as opposed to the private sector. Um, I've been on some statewide commissions and boards as well. And that's helped me in terms of interfacing with government and the private sector, whether it's the State Board of Education or whether it's uh, the Aloha Stadium Authority, uh, which deals with large issues, uh, including the next biggest public works project after rail, the Aloha Stadium redevelopment uh, and the surrounding areas of Aloha Stadium. Uh, in terms of my background uh, running high school sports. Again, that was like holding statewide office. Uh, I had constituencies in every community uh, across this state. They were very passionate people. As we know, high school sports is, is of high interest to many people. And so uh, that experience as well helped me uh, and it will uh, become what I feel will be an effective mayor because I'm familiar with those communities as well. And last, I did mention before, and I'll mention it again, uh, being able to work directly with public sector labor unions is very, very important because the city workforce is comprised primarily of government sector labor unions. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Rick, is there anything that you'd like to add? 
Well, you know, I've been on the campaign trail a little bit less than uh, seven months, I guess. We announced in February, and one month later, we were shut down. So my my vision of how we were going to campaign to be able to get out specifically into all the communities and meet with people was cut short by that. That said, we've done countless Zoom calls, and we've tried whenever possible to go out and meet an individual here and an individual there and try to listen. But I want to offer the fact that the lens of my newsroom and what we did day in and day out throughout the whole state and how that involved political leaders, union leaders, labor, the stories we did, all of that stuff, it's long, long, for a long time, put me in touch with all segments of this island of Oahu and all the districts and, and the people and the overall need. So I, it's not like I feel like I'm not in touch with the needs of the people living here for 55 years. That's the reason why I'm running for this job right now is to be a leader. Didn't want it to be during the result of COVID, but to work on the things that the people here really deserve to have in the way of leadership at City Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Keith, is there anything that you'd like to add? As I mentioned before, I'll continue to do what I've always done, and that's listen, learn, and work collaboratively with all the stakeholders that make up our great city. Uh, I also want to add that uh, I have plans, uh, whether it's the Housing for All plan or the Oahu Recovery Plan. And so if I'm fortunate enough to be elected mayor, I'll be able to hit the ground running and start implementing these plans and lead us through this recovery from COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Okay, will you please be the first to respond to Kathy Wyatt's next question? Hi again. Um, a short introduction, I'm Kathy Wyatt. I'm founder and president of a nonprofit organization that's based on a, um, an adult daycare center and I do a lot of community education as well. Uh, I'm on the volunteer member of this board and I'm also on the board of uh, the public uh, policy advisory board for the elderly affairs. And that being said, my question is this. The current mayor's program for oversight of visitors is not working. And I have personal experience to prove that. How would you make it work? Are you talking, uh, can you explain that? Sorry, Kathleen. Um, what, what's his plan or program? Okay, well, we've been letting hundreds of visitors in. We don't know where they're going. I know they're not being monitored well because um, I had personal visitors myself and they were called one time the week they were here and they were called two days after they got home to see if they were still here. So the program is not working. They're everywhere and we don't know where they are and who's, who's watching them. Okay, got it. Well, first we need to allocate more resources to monitor our visitors. Um, that's problem number one. I mean, if we're going to let them come here and, and not be able to track them down or, or find out whether they're carrying COVID while they're here, um, that's a problem. So let's allocate more resources to them. And there's CARES Act funding for that. And so let's use that money to make sure that we monitor the visitors that we already have here. Uh, another idea that I've heard of uh, from other jurisdictions and other countries is um, let's use cell phones. Uh, everyone, almost everyone has a smartphone now and through the GPS tracking, of a cell phone or smartphone, that's one way to monitor the comings and goings of people. That's another way to uh, communicate with people. Um, I don't know if I'd go the route of some places that have put ele electronic bracelets or anklets, but you know, if it's to ensure the public safety and public health, I mean, maybe we do need to consider that as well. But clearly, Kathleen, we need to do more. It's not enough. And we better be ready uh, if and when we open our doors, doors to tourism at large. Um, we're, we're not going to be talking about hundreds of visitors. We're going to be talking about thousands of visitors. And so hopefully we have a plan before then. Okay, let me just give you an example. Um, if you missed the call that they called to see where you are and that make sure you're where you're supposed to be quarantining, that if you miss the call and you basically will call us back within 24 hours, within 24 Four hours, you could have been all over the island doing a thousand things. So that's that was part of the break I'm talking about. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you. Your response, please. Well, it's obviously a very complicated uh, situation, unprecedented. And I opened up this discussion today, acknowledging the Kakua Council for its advocacy for our community. And so I know that you filed a lawsuit on contact tracing. I don't know what the status of that is, but that's to be applauded. I got from Kathy the frustration 
uh, if you will, with this. And, you know, I, I uh, will second it. I think we also need more manpower. What we saw was an exposure at the state level. I mean, you're talking about the mayor, but at the state level, and look at the exodus of our senior people and Bruce Anderson, Dr. Sarah Park, et cetera, and the, and the exposure that we had on the lack of people available to do contact tracing and whatever else we were doing. So I, uh, I will side here with what actually um, was just stated by my opponent from the standpoint of manpower. This is absolutely critical. We need to get tourism going. It's absolutely the engine financially for us, uh, but we need to get that stuff straightened out and that's gonna take people making it a priority, but it actually starts at the state level as well. There are monies available for this. This is the kind of stuff we should definitely be prevailing ourselves on. It's also job creation, and we're just going to have to be much more diligent on that because of what's at stake. We don't want our people getting sick. We don't want people in the hotels getting sick. We want to protect this community. God knows, given what we've just gone through since March and closing down, why would we get stupid now? Now's the time to get smart. We should have learned a lot. We should be able to do a lot more. We need to appropriate people and money towards this situation. And that's where I come from, and I wish you well with your lawsuit. All right, Keith Amamiya, would you like to add anything? Well, Kathleen, this is another example that, that government needs to do more listening and less telling. And so uh, they need to engage and, and listen to people like you uh, to, to find solutions to these types of problems. And as mayor, I'm going to do what I've always done, and that's listen and learn and engage everyday community members uh, and, and not just special interest groups. Uh, the other area that I would focus on from a city standpoint is talk to HPD and get their ideas on how to address this problem because they're the ones that are charged with enforcing this law. So I would ask them on ways to improve the current system because clearly it's not working. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Rick, do you wanna add anything? Um, no, I, I think the police department um, would rather could really help here in, in helping us enforce some of these things and not necessarily the way they've been going about giving citations right now, but I think there's resources we can draw on. We just have to do a better job of it. We have to recognize we're an island in the middle of the ocean and we need people to come visit us to stimulate our economy. We also need to protect our people. I can just say it over and over again. We should be paying attention to the things that are the absolute priority and, and not have any room for doubt or leave anything on the table. It needs to be a maximum, maximum effort on that regard. Thank you very much. Rick, will you please be the first to respond to Barbara Services question? Barbara, are you there? I'm here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi, Rick. Um, I just wanted to, uh, oh, I want to say a little background. I have 43 years in child welfare. And then as I got older, shifted gears to Kapuna issues. I'm very active with AARP. Kokua Council, and also along with Kathy and hopefully Rick uh, Tabor, the um, Policy Advisory Board for Elder Affairs. I'd like to ask this. Um, there are problems at different levels of leadership in the county government. I'd like to know how you're going to identify these issues and what hardball steps you might take to remedy the problems. Well, you know, that's, a, that's sort of a classic scenario uh, in my career, Barbara, I've always been the person who was hired to replace the person who was fired. Again, today I opened up trying to take you quickly through a pretty broad resume. Uh, but anything and everything I've ever been involved in in turning the fates and fortunes of companies around has always been directly tied to the quality of men and women. So I've talked long and hard uh, in many leadership discussions about managing three kinds of capital. You know, the money part was just a byproduct. It was always about the human capital, the people, the men and women the quality of those people, but then how you embrace their primary, the primary derivative of your human capital, which was its intellectual capital. So I hold a pretty high standard on performance uh, and I hold a high standard on innovation and people with ideas and commitment and passion. So I will tell you that uh, I plan to look at each and every person, especially in our leadership roles that we have in city and county, and that's, they're going to be the most at risk from the standpoint of whether or not I think they're fit to do it. Right now, I'm trying to get the job myself. I've got to prove that I'm capable. But from that standpoint, as I said earlier, Barbara, that's job one. It's who's going to lead the city. So what I'm asking for is the responsibility and to be held accountable for the city. That's the ask. I'm not asking to run the city by myself. I've been clear from that on that right from the beginning. It's going to take an extraordinary group of men and women 
who are really passionate and committed to what we're doing to help lead us into the future. This pandemic has challenged us in ways none of us could have even imagined. So I think the selection of who gets to do that, you know, is going to be pretty rigorous. And I know what I'm going to be looking for. Thank you. Okay. Your response in two minutes, please. Sure. You know, when I was 32 years old, I was hired to run high school athletics across the state. That was a fairly young age uh, with a big responsibility. And they had their share of problems. They were, the organization was near insolvency. There were multiple lawsuits against it. Uh, there was a lot of uh, distrust and lack of confidence within the organization. And all the inst although the instinct was to run over everybody and clean house, uh, I quickly realized uh, that's not necessarily the most prudent course of action. You need to get the information from people first. You need to listen to all the different stakeholders. And, and sure, you can't take months and months and years and years to reorganize and, and change things, but you do need to listen to people first. And sometimes in that learning process, you'll figure out that the people you think that are the cause of the problem aren't really the cause of the problem, it's the system. And so that's the kind of approach I'll take with the city. Uh, clearly there's ways and areas that need to be improved, but it all comes down to people. It all comes down to listening, learning, and, and uh, having uh, meaningful dialogue with the various stakeholders that make up our city government. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Keith. Rick, is there anything that you'd like to add? No, just that it's a team effort. It's gonna be a team. I mean, yes, there are gonna be some systems we have to attack, but you're gonna do that through people. And we talked a couple of different times today about DPP being probably one of the most glaring and immediate situations that needs to be addressed. But there are a lot of other things too. I think that's the fascination in doing this job. That's the excitement about it because you get to be a high impact leader touching lots of groups. And so in that regard, uh, I went into this thinking it was gonna be the biggest leadership challenge of my life. COVID's made it definitely the biggest, but I will give you this last perspective. I've never been in a situation where I felt this kind of responsibility before. This goes right to the core about getting this job, stepping in and doing right by everybody at a level because of the need that I've never ever felt before. So turning all these profits and turning these companies around in the past was one thing. This is what it's come down to. And I feel like my life's work has taken me to this, to this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Keith, is there anything you'd like to add? Just to reiterate that it's an enormous task. I'm up to the task and I will surround myself with the strongest team possible. I'll continue to do what I've always done and that's work together with people, collaborate and, and just find a way to get it done, um, you know, and, and not worry about who gets the credit and, and not worry about who's aligned with who. Uh, that seems to be the problem with politics today, whether it's on the municipal level, all the way to the federal level. We, not, we need to set our egos aside and our personalities aside and, and work in one direction. Um, the people of Honolulu are counting on the mayor to do that, and that's what I'll do. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. All right. Um, candidates, this is going to be the last question. Keith, will you please be the first to respond to Doug Matsuoka's question? Uh, hi, my last question was about renters. This one is about owners. We have a lot of seniors that own their own properties in uh, what were nice neighborhoods that suddenly become uh, luxury condo areas and their property tax uh, blows up. They're on fixed incomes, can't afford it. Would you be willing to consider property tax caps for kupuna at a certain age or something like that? Absolutely, yes. Uh, as you know, Doug, I think uh, Kauai County passed a, a measure maybe a year ago to address this issue. Uh, it's not fair, it's not right for our kupuna to have to pay real property taxes that they simply can't afford because of the rising property values of the surrounding houses and, and buildings where they live in. Uh, some of these properties that our kupuna own are multi-generational and it's simply not right, it's simply not fair that they would have to give up that property because they can't afford real property taxes. Thank you. 
Thank you, Keith. Rick, your, uh, your response in two minutes, please. Sure, absolutely be in favor of doing that. I'm actually in favor in a bigger picture, but we'll bring it back to the Kapuna, of doing everything and anything we possibly can do under these circumstances to stop the increased cost of living here because it's just become, you know, much more than people can bear. But with respect to a, a cap on that, I think, again, going back to the segment of this population who've been fortunate enough in this case to own homes, to protect that, protect their equity, protect them, absolutely would be very much in favor of doing that. All right, thank you, Rick. Keith, is there anything that you'd like to add? I think I pretty much said it all in my first uh, response and that's yes to Doug's question. So nothing right. else, to thank you. Thank you, Keith. And Rick, you have an extra minute. Do you uh, wanna add? No, I, I think I just wanna say what I said earlier about being an age-friendly city. I think, you know, as I said earlier, you know, society's judged a lot by how it treats its most vulnerable in this particular case, since I'm probably older than some of the people on this call this morning. Um, you know, I'm real sensitive that way uh, on a very personal level. So I think that this is one of those things in which we, we look at that we do that's just smart and decent. And that's true and whether we're talking about building crosswalks or sidewalks or whatever. These are the things we just incorporate into how we live here and what we do. And that's the role of a leader. I think it's a great opportunity for us, great opportunity, Doug, to do something like that and put that in place. This probably should have been done a long time ago. All right, thank you very much. Um, it's widely accepted that trust and confidence must be restored in our government. So we're interested in your fundamental values, the content of your character. Regardless of the legality, the complexity, or the jurisdiction involved, we ask you to provide immediate yes or no, agree or disagree, approve or disapprove type responses to these topics with only three seconds for both candidates to respond simultaneously before we go on to the next topic. All right. For example, regardless of the current law and jurisdiction regarding the topic legalized marijuana, you might answer yes if you agree in general with the policy or answer no if you do not believe in legalizing marijuana. A yes, agree, or approve is indicated by your own thumbs up. A no, disagree, or disapprove with your own thumbs down. The candidates, please be ready. Here are the topics. You have three seconds to respond. Civil asset forfeiture. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question, Lila, go ahead. What, what Civil asset forfeiture. What is that? I'm sorry? I'm not hearing that word, it's not coming through, Lila. Civil asset forfeiture. Civil asset forfeiture? That's where you can take somebody's house away from them? Is that what that's about? Next yeah. question. Governor Ige's suspension of open government laws. Governor Ige's, Governor Ige suspended yeah. the government yeah, laws. Yeah. Next question. Unlicensed care homes. No, no. Next question. Police accountability. Next question. Homeless, houseless sweeps. Done differently, I'll say no. I, I'm, the policy doesn't work. President Obama's beach wall. Mm. Police reform. The rail to Ala Moana. Thank you. Starting with Rick Blangiardi, you have up to one minute to enhance or explain your rapid responses. Wow, wow that's a lot to... Uh... To, to take on. I thought you were going to ask me about legalized marijuana. So for the record, I'd be against that. I was a proponent of medical marijuana and actually getting dispensaries took positions on that editorially. Um, you know, I, I, I was proud enough to get the, um, to give you a sense of who I am to get Shopo's endorsement. Yet I no sooner got Shopo's endorsement and the George Floyd incident happened. And suddenly everything was about transparency of police departments. And Senate Bill 85 was something the police, Shopo, who endorsed me, was against. Yet I was pro. I was for that. I met with them. I worked on it. Because for years, in television news, as I said earlier today, about trust being the holy grail, we argued with the police department for better transparency. So despite the fact 
that I got Chopo's endorsement, and it meant a lot to me. And as much as I believe in the police department, I took a contrarian position during this election, and we were able to work through it. I think that probably speaks to how I will lead and my integrity as a leader. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Keith Amamiya's turn. I won't address any specific question other than to say that whenever I make a decision, it'll be based on what's in the best interest of working class people or what's in the best interest of those without the voice, whether it's Pacific Islanders or people uh, who are unemployed or homeless or uh, down on their luck. Uh, they simply have been ignored by our current political process, by our current elected officials, and I'm going to do whatever I can to give people like that a fighting chance to make it in Honolulu. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now ask each candidate to provide a closing statement of up to three minutes, starting with Keith Amamiya and followed by Rick Blanchiardi. Keith? Keith, you first, please. All right. Well, I just want to thank Lila and the Kokua Council again for this opportunity. Um, this is a pivotal election, and this election isn't about you. It isn't about me. It's about us. It's about everyone working together, working as a team. COVID-19 is an enormous challenge, but I firmly believe if we work together and stay together, we will get through this better than ever. My entire career has been devoted to public service. My entire career has been made for this moment. It's to do whatever I can to make Oahu the best it can be, not only for us, but for our future generations. So thank you again for this opportunity. And I humbly ask for your support to be your next mayor of the city and county of Honolulu. Aloha and mahalo. Thank you very much, Keith. Rick Blanchiardi, your statement. Well, thank you, Lila. And I want to thank all of you again, the Kukua Council, not only for hosting today's event again, but actually for the advocacy that you do and what you stand for. And it's terrific. And I look forward to even working with you more going forward. So, Look, my life has been here. I was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I start out saying that today, but 55 years of my life has been here. Uh, 30 years of the 43 were in broadcast, but in the 13 years I was away, despite all those big jobs, I came back to Hawaii every year. And I told the press when I came back, I said, you know, I moved to the mainland in 89, but I never left Hawaii. And since I've been home for the 18 years I've been back here, everything I've done, both professionally and in my volunteer work, speaks for itself. I'm very proud of that body of work. I never saw myself running for office. I never did. What I responded to was a perception that perhaps you shared, and it's been alluded to several times today, in the leadership crisis we face. And that's what caused that decision. So I gave up a job I loved and people that I loved and work that mattered and the work that I loved to, to walk away, it took a year of my life off at a time, as I look at the faces on this phone where you all know we count the years very carefully sacrifice financially, as I said, and having to fund myself halfway through this for all the right reasons. So I never saw COVID-19 coming. None of us did. I wish to God it wasn't the circumstance that it is. This will be a very, very tough road ahead. Um, I'd like to think, as I said earlier, it's about the seasoning. It's about the experience, it's about the contributions, uh, and bringing everything I know to bear at creating success, building morale. So I will tell you this, I believe in hope. I don't believe in false hope. I've been very guarded in my comments about making empty campaign promises. But I know right now that the fear and uncertainty is bigger than ever and it grows by the day. And if through our actions, as we both said earlier today, we can start to create some hope. And if in fact, through our actions, we do create that hope when the time comes that I leave office, if I can leave a people feeling confident, everything in that journey from fear and uncertainty to hope to confidence will have made it all worthwhile. So I'll just leave you with this, one of the lines that really inspired me many years ago. I was reading a paragraph on servant leadership, which is where, again, it comes from, it's about you putting others first. It's a great paragraph written by George Bernard Shaw, a great Irish playwright in the year 1903, in a play called Man and Superman. And he simply says, and this has been something that really resonated with me a long time ago, and it's how I look at life now. He says, you know, that in serving a community, the harder I work, the more I live, the more I love. And then he says, because I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. 
I am looking at this challenge right now to give you everything I possibly have. And I've got 50 years of success behind me in this community, especially. I thank you. I humbly ask you for your vote. God bless all of you. Thank you very much, Rick. Mahalo to Keith Amamiya, Rick Blanchiardi for participating in Cocoa Council's mayoral debate. Cocoa Council hopes that we've made it easier for the people of Oahu to select the best candidate to represent us in the Honolulu Mayor's Office. It was truly a pleasure to host this forum and debate. As a reminder, when you receive your general election ballot, please be sure to vote, return it as soon as possible so it can be counted. Again, mahalo for your very generous use of your time. Malama Pono, please take care of yourselves and aloha from Kukua Council. Thank you. See you later. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. aloha. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.